Just to, to give a bit of background about um, Ausbrokers Countrywide, uh, we've been around since since 1952. Um, there's about 70 of us um, out in, well, we're not in the office yet, um, but there's some some in the office up in Queensland. Um, we take care of a pretty broad range of uh, insurance solutions, anything from from professional indemnity, which is exclusively what I what I manage, um, through to sort of corporate end, uh, businesses and, and manufacturers, through to you know home contents and, and your cars and your home and you know landlords policy and things like that. Um, we've got you know over thirteen thousand clients. Um, we do have a dedicated claims team. So we have 12 claim staff that are there 24 um, seven, which is a brilliant offering and it's a fantastic resource for our clients, um, both in the uh, professional space. So if you know, you've know you got a question or an issue at nine o'clock at night that pops up um, or you know for, for some of our clients who have got property and things like that should, if, if there is an event, you know, if a tree falls down or window breaks or fire or anything like that, there's someone there to, to answer the phone and be able to direct direct traffic. Now, professional indemnity insurance is written on what's called a claims made basis. So that means that it's the policy in place at the time of the claim that will respond. So say if you did a, a survey on a vessel two years ago, um, and it turns out that, that the vessel was um, not up to spec or, or the, the hull was cracked or there was an issue with, with one of the hoses or, or something to that effect. Um, and you only find out about it now because the seller is the, the buyer has taken too long to, to go and find it out or, or uh, there's an issue with a, you know, there was a, a pollutant in the, in the hull um, and a you know, polluted grain went out. It's the policy in place at the time of claim that will respond. So not the policy from three years ago, the policy from from now um, which is completely the opposite to most other insurance products but all professional indemnity around the world has, has always been written like that the policy responds for all civil liability claims uh, and costs that arise from from defending that matter uh, civil liability basically means almost anything and everything for the failure to provide your professional services. Um, that can be, you know, your, your vessel surveys, cargo surveys, pre-purchase, anything that you provide as your professional professional services. Uh, and also the, the legal costs that attach to that. So even in the event of a claim, um, the actual indemnity, so the amount that you that you have to pay out as a as a compensation is also paid as well as the, the legal costs in going to court, engaging lawyers. Most insurance lawyers will run between sort of four to $600 an hour, um, depending on who it is that, that gets engaged, whether it's the, the junior or whether it's the principal lawyer. Um, in the event of a claim, um, we get notified, we liaise with the insurer and we have a panel of, of uh, lawyers that we use to, well, the insurer will, will use, um, so they get obviously better rates and they're acting on behalf of, of the insurer. Um, who's covered by the, the policy? The policy is issued to the entity and will automatically cover any directors, officers or employees of that entity. If you engage any subcontractors, it only provides what's called vicarious liability. Okay, so that means that if a claim arises, from work that a subcontractor does on your behalf, we will protect you. We do not protect the subcontractor. Um, it can be included, but in a normal circumstance and a normal off the shelf professional indemnity policy, it only protects the company and the company's employees uh, for, those, for those services. Uh, now, to sort of come back to what what what's a claim? What is it that um, we would need to know need to know about? Um, a circumstance that may develop into a claim needs to be notified to ensure you have cover. Now, that's not if if there's anything at all that that comes up as a concern, 
anything that comes up, up as a, or that that might have been something that we need to talk to talk to someone about, just give me a call. Um, the the insurer will never have a problem with notifying anything and everything. The issue arises if you knew about an issue that happens today and then in two years' time it turns into a claim or even in 12 months' time it turns into a claim. It will be deemed as what's called a known circumstance. So you knew about it. You knew that there was a problem, but you elected not to tell the insurer. So there's no issue in, in us telling the insurer and saying, hey, Bob Smith did a, did a survey on, on this ship um, and we think there could be, a, could be a problem. Then if that eventuates into a claim, we, we lock, lock in cover with that underwriter and ensure that, that um, cover's in place. Um, the circumstance, it, it's what, it's what was, would be deemed as um, reasonable for you to notify. So if, if, if push came to shove, you know, if it really got sort of a little bit uh, questionable, it would go to a panel of your peers. So if, if um, yeah, Bob Smith didn't notify that there was a, an issue with the survey, we would go and ask 10 other surveyors, you know, uh, industry pillars, if, if you had this same situation occur, would it be fair and reasonable that you went and notified the insurer? So unfortunately, it's not sort of a nice, you know, a nice, clean, defined um, uh, definition of what a circumstance is. It's what would be reasonable, reasonably perceived as something that should be notified. Um, a claim, when it turns into an actual claim, it's usually a letter of demand or a writ or, you know, if you get someone ring up and say, oh, you know, I, I want you to pay me $10,000 because I need to repair my hull or um, my load of, of grain was, was wrecked or uh, the, the, the vessel wasn't unloaded correctly or something like that. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, that's what normally normally a claim is. You'll get it in writing. Uh, as soon as any of those things happen, give me a call. Excuse me, we Wayne. can talk through it. Further. We can talk to the underwriter. Yes. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Yes. You. Yep. Are you able? We're not seeing your slides move along. I'm not sure if it's a technical glitch or what's happening. Are you able to move them along so we can follow along with you? Ah. So are you not seeing that? We're just, we're just seeing the front page. Oh, that's a bit strange. It might just be a technical glitch. I'm sure, are we able to provide these to the members? After? Yeah, 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 definitely. Can you see that? Yes, that's great. Okay. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. Okay. I can, yeah, I can email this over. Yeah. Sorry, um, no, no problem at all. No problem. Um, yeah, claims usually a written demand for, for compensation. A few things more I'm full of um, with personal indemnity insurance um, when looking through a, a standard policy. Um, it, it doesn't cover, it doesn't provide cover for assumed liability or contracts beyond what you would normally be exposed to. So if you enter into any contracts, particularly with larger firms or with uh, government departments, large ports, um, um, uh, mining companies in particular like to do it, um, they try and offload all the liability onto yourself. So sometimes you'll find yourself in a position that you, you're being asked to sign a contract um, to wear further indemnity than what you would normally carry. A standard off the shelf policy will not provide that cover. Um, it will only cover you as to what you would normally be liable for. If you are being asked to uh, sign these contracts, again, we, we can review these um, indemnity clauses and we can provide alternate wording that will either A, soften it 
or B, um, change it to a point that the underwriter will accept, um, in which case it, it covers yourself and, and takes away that, that commercial risk. Fee disputes are considered uh, commercial in nature and not insured. Now, they're obviously um, different ways to skin a cat. So if it is a matter of a fee dispute, uh, sometimes we find that clients' claims change from being a fee dispute to being a dispute for a certain amount of money that also happens to be equal to what the fee is. Um, so it can change from being a covered claim to a, uh, from a not covered claim to a, a covered claim. Um, bodily injury and property damage under a professional indemnity policy. Now, whilst it might seem that that's not really a, an issue for a marine surveyor, uh, hypothetically, uh, if you, you did an inspection on a ship um, and say some of the parts didn't, didn't work as they were supposed to and the ship crashed and ran aground or the ship capsized, tipped over and, and there was loss of life. If there is a full bodily injury and property damage exclusion, there will be no cover. You will indefinitely be drawn into the matter uh, and it, it, you will become, uh, in Australian law, um, directors of, of companies and individuals. So it's very important to ensure that at the very least, there is a professional services cover arising from bodily injury and property damage. Even if there's a small, I'll, I'll get to a claims example uh, a bit further on. Um, pollution exclusions, very much the same. Um, Whilst it's 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 minor, um, if there was a, a, a leak in a hose or uh, something to that effect, a split hose or, or a bursting hose or a valve that wasn't um, closing properly or, or something like that, um, probably more so in, in your um, grain inspections and, um, and um, those kinds of surveys. If there's a pollution event and the EPA get involved there will be a $300,000 claim every day of the week. They are extremely, extremely retentive uh, and very um, uh, strict in their scrutiny of, of the matter and the way that they draw it out. So it's important that there's no pollution exclusion present. Even some underwriters will wear what's called a, a sudden and accidental um, cover. That's that's no good for, for you guys because what you do if a pollution event was to arise, so if a, a boat capsized or, or a, a hose burst and there was an oil leak, that effect, that's not going to be sudden and, and accidental. That is likely to be a slow leak or a seepage or something like that. Consequential loss exclusion. Um, if, if a vessel, a commercial vessel who's transporting goods, um, container ships, um, tankers, um, uh, vessels that, that move um, a quantity of, of goods or alternatively, um, even vessels that are used for, for touring or cruise liners, maybe not so much cruise liners at the moment. Um, but consequential loss exclusion says that if there was a claim uh, and the, the owner of the vessel lost the income, whilst it was being repaired or whilst uh, any, any lost income that arose as a result of the claim. <clears throat> Some insurers will try and exclude the consequential loss. So they'll try and exclude that income that would have been earned. We, we do not want this. This is basically why you, why you purchase the insurance. Um, if you have provided a professional service to that third party uh, and a claim arises and that third party loses income, that's what you purchase insurance for. Um, it, you know, a fishing vessel, for instance, you know, say if a fishing vessel got pulled out of the water for three months to be repaired, that three months could be the vast majority of its income earning time for the year, and they've lost all of their, their income that they would have generated. If you have a consequential loss exclusion, then there's no cover at all. 
um, yeah, which we, we just, we would never accept um, because it's just not an acceptable risk uh, and that's not what you you purchase insurance for. Uh, risk management. Insurers have clamped down um, a lot in recent years. Um, I, I'm not sure if uh, you know, some of you may may have seen my name around. I started a relationship with, with Ames many years ago, um, five or six years ago, um, in a previous life, life at another broker. Um, there was quite a large number of insurers who would offer cover, but they would offer it at, at a increased premium. What's happened in the insurance market over the last couple of years, um, Lloyds of London have incurred a two billion pound loss in 2018. This was as a result of two main culprits, one being Marine. So Marine spans from, um, you know, container ships losing losing a, a container to container ships being hijacked to goods being transferred, um, ports, harbours, things like that. And the other one being professional indemnity insurance in Australia specifically. Um, which meant that nine insurers withdrew from the professional indemnity market at the start of 2019. As 2019 rolled on, there was another two insurers that withdrew. This meant that there was an instant contraction of the market and the number of insurers, insurers that were prepared to provide cover, not just for in, in the marine space, but, but all professional indemnity. This meant that they have become uh, a lot more uh, selective as to what they want to see and what kind of risk they would like. To um, having a clear, uh, having clear terms of engagement, uh, an outline of what you are doing, what you're engaged to do, and what you're not doing is extremely important in the event of a of a claim arising, or in the event of a dispute arising. Um, because it will draw back to that, that contract as to what was signed and what was said. Um, the AIMS documents are fantastic. Insurers love those. Um, the, we provide them to, to the insurers and they are, has reviewed these documents. And if you would hear to these, these documents um, that, that um, Stacy or Susan can provide. The insurers are very happy with these. Even the uh, your ongoing CPD compliance. Um, if there's this change in rules, change in regulations, um, change in requirements that, that you would have to adhere to, um, insurers are, are very happy with this. In, I, I, I can tell you, in the absence of these things, um, insurers are less likely to provide cover at all. It, it's not even a matter of. Um, reduced premiums or increased premiums or anything like that, they actually just won't quote. Um, they are yeah, very, very uh, uh, selective at the moment and becoming also in this, in this COVID environment. Uh, claim example. Um, I, I actually had this claim um, a number of years ago um, the particular surveyor was very experienced, more than 15 years experience, was just doing a dry dock inspection on the vessel. The, um, the owner of the vessel was standing next to, next to, the, next to the boat. Um, the fellow who ran the port was also standing there. Uh, he followed his checklist, had his terms of engagement, did everything he was supposed to do, ran through everything, uh, unfortunately for him, as he got out of the, the engine bay, uh, out of the hull, he knocked a valve. When the vessel was put back in the water, it was a slow leak. It was left um, at the jetty overnight and the vessel half sunk. Uh, this was obviously a property damage claim arising as a result of a
professional service provided. Um, the vessel was pulled out, repaired, and put back together um, for 170,000. Um, so to sort of delve into insurer's mind for, for a minute, uh, if they've settled a claim for 170,000 and the average marine surveyor's premium is less than $3,000, it means the account is running at 5,000%. So that's why um, having premium pools can definitely change the insurer's uh, perspective on <laughs> on risk uh, and what's acceptable and, and um, how claims uh, shift. The matter, even having uh, uh, increased excesses. Touch on what, what Countrywide are doing um, as far as arranging the, the, um, the program for, uh, for the marine surveyors. Um, I had a conversation with one of our underwriters. Look, at the moment, I've got three particular underwriters that I, I speak to, depending on what the class of risk is, um, what the uh, main, main work that, that you do is. Um, there's one particular underwriter that would like to have an exclusive arrangement with us. Um, we, we have web, well, what's called a web form. So it's a web-based proposal form. So if any of you have, um, but to me, we, we send out just a link, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, just a link. If you click on that link, you'll click through and fill out a proposal form. It can be done on a tablet, on a phone. It doesn't matter if it's, if it's a Mac or a micro, Microsoft computer. It was being purposely done that, that you don't have to, it doesn't matter which platform you use. Um, when you submit that proposal form, um, it will get sent to us. Now for future renewals, instead of having to fill out a whole new form, what will happen is that form will be sent to you with three spots to check. So it's already on every year. It just takes that whole, whole issue away. Um, this one particular underwriter, we've spoken to them and uh, as they are really keen to, to have an exclusive arrangement, a copy of that form will instantly be submitted to the underwriter for consideration. Um, we are final in the final stages of having exclusive discounted rates for AIMS members um, and be able to turn the whole thing around a lot faster um, instead of having to submit it and wait for the underwriters to, to actually underwrite and, and um, review the, the uh, program, which look, this is a fantastic outcome. Um, they are very keen to to support us and very keen to support AIMS. Um, and obviously, the, the, once we, we build a, a bigger portfolio of members, we'll be able to provide um, uh, more enhancements to the policy. Um, but they are very keen and um, are very interested in, in doing this. And hopefully, look, we can streamline the whole process, um, make you know make your turnaround a lot lot quicker. Um, at the moment, <clears throat> excuse me, between working from home uh, and having the deal into London. Um, everything is, is taking a little bit longer than what it normally would um, between yeah, people working at home and uh, anyone who's, who's working from home and got children is, uh, look, it's a, it's a different world, but hopefully we'll, we'll come through that. I'm down in Melbourne. I'm not sure where everyone else is placed. Um, so I've just, just been able to go out for a coffee this morning, which is just, you know, I can't wait to be able to actually go out for a beer, but look, we'll just, we'll just have to wait. We'll just have to wait. Um, all right, no worries. Look, questions. Um, what? You know, uh, Wade, we've had one come through on the chat. You think that I can? I can. Uh, yep. Yeah, Bear with me. So Rob has asked: Are permanent contractors who form the usual business that is part of the company structure treated differently from occasional contractors in terms of terms of coverage? It, it's on. It's generally on the, the the definition of what a a issue would use that in a normal circumstance if they are a contractor if they're not a PAYG employee they're deemed as a third party and would, we, we would only protect you we don't protect the subcontractor so if that's a normal thing if they're going to be engaged in an ongoing um, basis we can arrange for them to be listed on the policy to ensure that they're actually covered in addition to to the entity 
but just be mindful if they're listed on your policy, two things. Um, they have full recourse under your policy. So any claims experience will obviously have an impact on your, your policy moving forward. So just something to be mindful of. Okay, and we've got one more question that's come through here from Paul Tits. Does a marine surveyor need PI assurance if he or she intends to look for work as an employee for a marine surveying company? Well, I think no, so if you're if you're an employee, yeah, you'll be automatically covered by um, the, the the company's professional indemnity insurance. Um, yeah, it, it, I've heard of instances where um, where potentially um, larger companies step into a new area so they, they might step into you know um, marine architecture or something like that and they try and tell the, the employee that they need to go and obtain insurance to that effect we, we can't the insurers won't be issued to either you know a sole trader or a, um, a proprietary limited entity or, or something to that effect if anyone else has any questions feel free to unmute yourself and ask yeah, I can um, Wade, can you hear me? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I can hear you, yep. Yeah, it's uh, Paul Titz here. Um, yeah, just uh, my problem is, as you know, I can't get a quote for uh, PI insurance just to put yeah. in my application with AMSA. I'm just wondering, um, is there a reason why AMSA, they demand a quote or having PI insurance just to do the orals? Because I don't think it's fair to be why they're asking this when some marine surveyors might work as an employee for a company or might look for work. I don't look, understand I, this. I can't comment on what um, AMSA do or do not require. I know that it's part of their their, um, their accreditation requirements, but I'm not sure as to why um, they would require you to have a quote if you intend to work as an employee. Yeah, well, they told me it's part of their regulations, but yeah, they haven't got back to me they're not, they're not saying why they're asking this. Uh, I can understand why if you're working as a, your own business to have a PI insurance, but uh, uh, as you know, I can't get a quote, so I can't put in my AMSA application um, without PI so I, insurance I, quote I, or I having the insurance. Spoke so. To the yeah, so I spoke to the underwriter this morning. Look, I can, I can, I can issue you with a, a written letter advising that your professional indemnity, if you're an you'll be automatically covered. So look, I'll put that in writing on AMSA and see if that's um, acceptable to them. Because if you're an employee, um, the, the, the insurers just won't issue the, the quote to to an individual. It has to be issued to an entity. Yeah, well, my plan was I was going to start my own business and work for myself, but um, yeah, yep. it doesn't look like my actual choice, looks like it. So I don't... Um, yeah, I just don't think their regulations, they've thought it through that re, uh, for people who want to work as an employee. That wasn't my aim, but at this stage, I don't have any choice, it looks like. I have seen your... Okay, yeah, look, it might be something that... Sorry, Wade. I have no, seen... that's all right. Look, it might be... <laughs> go, go ahead, <laughs> Stacey. Oh, I have referred it to Susan, but I haven't had a chance to have a chat to her yesterday. So I will follow up with her today because she knows a lot more about the answer process than I do. And she may be able to provide some more light there. Uh, now, Sue, I can see your email. How experienced are your lawyers dealing with marine survey matters in court? Um, no, it's it's not possible to, in, to uh, nominate a, an independent lawyer. Um, The insurers have, uh, they might have, you know, uh, one insurer may have 65 panel lawyers that they, they choose from. Some will specialise in construction, some specialise in, you know, accountants and financial planners, and some will specialise in, in marine specific areas. Um, the reason that they don't um, allow you to appoint your individual lawyers is because they go through a panel process. So one, there's there's discounted rates because obviously they're gonna they're going to pile them on with um, a certain amount of work 
So they request discounted hourly rates. And secondly, the lawyers get given um, authority to act on the insurer's behalf. So say if there's, a, if there's a claim, the underwriter says, yep, you can, if you go through the process and you need to settle this matter for X number of dollars, we provide you with that. that authority to do so. Um, and as I understand, um, I have seen, I have seen um, clients appoint their own lawyers and unfortunately end up quite a bit of money out of pocket because the underwriter won't add up significantly different, um, unfortunately. But look, they're, they're, the underwriters are not sort of hard and fast and sort of say, no, you must use this lawyer. Um, they'll have a discussion and they'll they'll provide their panel and do some back and forth. So they so they you know appoint lawyer A and we like lawyer C. Then we have some some discussion there, but unfortunately, uh, yeah, that's the that's the extent of it. Why? Because do they have uh, so there are people that have expertise specifically in marine survey matters? I mean, it's reassuring, obviously, if you go to court to know that someone's all over the technical aspects of the defence um, is, is, are those yes, people they, they, or are they just lawyers of a general kind of nature? Claims matter is, um, yeah, we have, I have some, some lawyers that I have also probably half of my portfolio would be engineering, particularly using that area because they are specialists. Um, and that's the same in marine surveying, um, if there's a marine claim. Um, parts of our business uh, have quite large um, uh, manufacturing and transport uh, clients. Uh, as such, there's obviously been quite large marine claims. There are specific lawyers that, that uh, the insurers will use that are specialists in that, that area. Yeah. We try and steer clear of just generalists because it can leave um, or it'll leave the, the insurer exposed at the end of the day um, because mm -hmm. when it does go to court, they'll be left sort of uh, looking a little bit like Wally's uh, mm -hmm. if they're not quite uh, across what, what they do. And the insurer does not, I uh, sure does not want to pay anything that they don't have to don't have to pay. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Here <coughs> yeah. we go, away. Your internet's intermittent. Hopefully, it holds out. But one. Okay. Um, Oh, sorry, we've got another one here from Andrew Lachlan that's come through. Do all your insurers cover pre-purchase survey as many insurers now do not? Yeah, no, there's some that won't at all. There's some that just, just don't like it. Um, I don't really know why. I haven't I haven't sort of seen claims come from, from that area. Um, two of my markets will cover it, no problem. Um, one absolutely flat will not cover um, pre-purchase in any way, shape or form, unless it's, unless it's a sort of sort of smaller percentage of, of what you do. Um, but yes, we have two underwriters who, who will cover that. And the one that we are looking at, at having an exclusive arrangement with, they will uh, they will cover it. I have no issue with it. Wait, a question that a member um, asked me. Sorry, I didn't. Yep, yeah, go ahead, Stacey. A question that got posed to me at some stage previously was if a member does ABC types of survey and is asked as a one-off to do a type D, is there anything they can do for coverage for that as a one-off? Uh, as long as it's sort of still within the scope, just, just drop me an email. It's very easy for, the, for us to go to the underwriter and say, oh, look, you know, Bob Smith normally does... Uh, um, <sighs> normally does these kinds of surveys but has been asked to, to do some some grain survey work um, just as a you know to help out with something um, there's no issue with with going back to the underwriter and having a chat about that um, when you do fill out the proposal form it is as to what you know to that to that date um, so we don't nobody expects you to know you know to be out of crystal ball happen over the next 12 months what i told them about just give us a call or drop me an email and we'll, we'll have a chat to the underwriter there's no problem uh, in, in you know getting things slightly amended or, or tweaked or putting something in writing that's no problem at all does 
Does anyone else, have we missed anyone in the chat or anyone else have any other questions? Hey, um, Stacey, the terms of engagement form that you, and Susan's referred to it um, before, I haven't actually seen that. Now, where can we access a copy of that? So it is in the members area of the website, but I can also, um, after the meeting today, I can send a link out so you can go straight to it. Oh, that'd be great, thanks. Yeah, no problems at all. And there's also the terms and conditions in there as well. So I don't, have you seen those as well, Sue? Um, no, I have my own. Okay, no worries. Pretty, fairly explicit ones, yeah. but yeah. No worries. Send them as well. It'd be interesting to compare. Yep, no worries at all. Anyone else? Before I have a quick question. I don't know if it's really relevant or not. It is a... Um, an insurance report, my understanding is that they can only be done for a vessel owner. I have had calls from people um, clearly um, who have who, who are wanting a pre-purchase report but pretending to be the owner of the vessel so they can get the insurance report because they can't get pre-purchase ones. It seems to be a bit of a trend of that lately. Is there anywhere in writing that says that the insurance uh, survey can only be conducted for the vessel owner? No, there, there, there's no issue from, like, from an in, in insurance perspective. Um, you're being engaged to, I mean, if you strip it back to, you, you're engaged to provide a service and you'll turn up to, to do that service. Um, and to the best of your knowledge, you're doing it for the, the vessel owner. Um, and in, look, that's a perfect example. If you were on the vessel, you know, doing doing your, your survey and the owner of the vessel turned up, um, got a little bit, bit, bit shirty and and, um, and upset, then decided to take you to task because you were providing a, a professional service, your policy would respond. So if they decided to, you know, sue you for, I don't know, breach of privacy or something to that effect, that's what your policy will, will respond to. But as far as, um, because as far as you you're, you know, you are being engaged by the vessel owner to do a survey on it. So there's you no, mean, no... You mean if the actual vessel owner turns up while you're doing a survey for someone else who's pretending to be the owner? Correct. What yeah. if they don't turn up and this person that's pretending to be the owner, you give them a report in good faith? I've heard other insurers, uh, sorry, other surve uh, surveyors say they actually ask for proof of that. Is that... I'm just a bit unclear about where we... Look, it, it's, it's, again, up to your, your process. But if, you, if we stripped it back to, to where the claim would come from, if you're unaware of who the... If the individual individual has purported to be the vessel owner and asks you to do the, the vessel survey and you've done that in good faith, then a, a claim arises because the, the actual vessel owner turns up or, or, or is uh, not happy at the fact that you have provided that information, then that's what the policy would, would respond to because to the best of your knowledge, you provided a marine survey to the, the person who was the vessel owner. The insurer would protect you. Um, if you, you know, if you definitely, if you wanna um, um, put in your risk management process that you are going to ask for proof of the, the vessel owner, fantastic. Yep, absolutely. But there's no requirement for the insurer to do that. So we could do an, a, a condition evaluation survey for a person who's not the vessel owner for insurance purposes? Well, if, well, if you weren't aware of that, then yes. So if you were approached by someone who said, please come and um, inspect my, my boat, hmm. uh, and you went and did the, the uh, inspection report and then the actual owner was upset or you know didn't didn't give permission for that to be done and then chose to take you to task, the insurance would respond. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, wait, just a question, Paul Titz again. Hello? Yeah, you're right, Paul, go ahead. Uh, just got a question uh, with uh, exit strategy. So let's say a situation, a marine surveyor retires, so finishes doing marine surveying, doesn't renew his PI insurance, obviously he's retiring, but then it gets taken to court uh, maybe a couple of years later after he retired. Is he, 
Well, so what's the guy? Is he covered or not covered? Because he doesn't have current PI insurance. In place, professional indemnity being a claims made policy. Um, if you're looking to wind up the business, retire, or, or um, uh, finish up, there are a couple of ways to manage those things. Um, you can look at um, what's called runoff insurance policy that says we will cover Paul for all the work that he does that he has done prior to X date. Um, what generally happens is that the if you do it year by year, what generally happens is the premium drops on a sliding scale down to the insurer's minimum premium. You can alternatively look at taking out multi-year policies, which is a far more economical way to do it. Um, so, it, you know, say if you, you elected to purchase seven years runoff cover, it's generally about three and a half to four times the expiring premium for seven years runoff insurance, which is the statute of limitations. But if you elect to retire and finish up, if you don't have a policy in place at the time of the claim, no, there's, there's no cover. So all professional indemnity is written in this fashion. Yeah, yeah. because I, I looked at a video, um, I think it was 2016, there was a conference. So AMSA, they said they recommended marine surveyors when they retire or close business to maintain PI insurance for seven years after yes. they retired. But <clears throat> I mean, it's quite a quite a financial hit, you know, like, especially if you're retiring. Yeah, that's correct. Look, there's, there's different ways of managing it. <clears throat> um, when you are looking at, at winding up, what we recommend doing is having a chat to us. Uh, you know, say, say you know, in, your, in your normal business, you turn out, say, $500,000. If you go directly into runoff, the insurer rates on what's actually happened. So they rate on the last 12 months. What we recommend to do is you keep running the business for another 12 months. You know, even if you're retired or, or wound up or acting as an employee or whatever the case may be, then effectively your last 12 months turnover will be significantly less. It could be sub 10,000. You may do no work. But then when we go into runoff, when we go to the insurer for runoff rates, they're rating off a far lower um, base than what they would have prior to a month prior, if that, if that makes sense. Um, so instead of, you know, the insurer, the, the premium going from here to here to here to here to here, they're getting the insurer to rate from, you know, down here. So it drops a lot, a lot more, um, it drops a lot sharper thing. So there's different ways of, of managing it, um, but yeah, it, it, it does come at a cost. Um, to, to cover off those those seven years as per the statute. And look, some contracts will have requirements in there as well. Some contracts require you to maintain insurance for X number of years after you've done the work, um, particularly, you know, the large ports or, or large um, uh, mining companies or, or things like that. They'll have requirements within their contracts that state you must maintain insurance for, for X number of years after the, insurance, after the, the work is finished. Yeah, right. Up. Thanks, sir. Wade, we've had a couple of questions here that have come through from Steve Jones. Um, yep. He has used a new insurance company this year who cover for any operation connected with marine surveying, but they put a limit of 500000 on recreational vessels and pre-purchase. Is that something that you can comment on with your insurance? Uh, look, it's probably not something that I would, would particularly well, it's, it's, it's all relevant, isn't it? Um, if that's something that you normally do and, and the, the vessels that you normally um, um, inspect are less than that, then that's, that's no problem. Um, if that's something that uh, you also need to think about retrospectively what you've done in the past because it's the policy in place at the time of the claim that responds. So if you've now got a, a sublimit of 500,000, for any recreational vessels and pre-purchase, that would mean that if a, if you've done an inspection on a vessel from ten, you know five years ago, that was more than that, there will obviously be a sublimit on your policy of five hundred thousand. So, he's thinking about what you've done in the past. But look, I mean, yeah, this this will tie back to what 
um, we've sort of heard from from one or two insurers that they're not really that keen on pre-purchase. Um, yeah, with your with your T's and C's, uh, if you clearly outline it to your clients, it will slow down that process. Um, so if you did a you know a vessel that was seven hundred and fifty thousand and you outline to them, I only have cover up seven uh, up to half a million dollars, and the claim occurs. Um, it will provide some recourse, some um, contributory negligence. So they were aware that you didn't have some full cover. They still allowed you to do the job. So there is some negligence on their part, but you were aware some. Uh, and the insurer may reduce or refuse to, to pay the claim, given that you've um, acted outside of what the policy will respond to. And he's also asked, how do terms and conditions protect against future claims? Um, the, yeah, the terms and conditions is, is um, um, provides that that um, contributes to negligence. So it's a buy-in from from both sides that says, um, this is what I'm providing. This is the extent that I am liable to. Um, this is the, the job that, that I'm doing and this is what I'm not doing. Um, if, if it turns into a claim, that gets taken into account when moving through the claims process. Um, so, you know, hypothetically, say if a vessel was $100,000, the vessel sank um, because the, the hull was rotted out. Your job was to inspect the, the mast and the, you know, the balustrades. It was not to inspect the hull. So on the, the terms and conditions, it'll clearly say, I am here to do A and B. My job was not to inspect the hull. So you can't be held liable for something that you have not inspected. Um, that's, that's the kind of thing that, that it, um, that's how it, it mitigates your risk having good, clear terms and conditions. And I think that'll tie into Adam Stafford has asked, how important is it to have your terms and conditions or disclaimer agreed to before commencing your survey? And that ties in with what you were just saying. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Having them, uh, it, it's, it's important to have it um, either signed or, or written agreement. Um, if, it's a, if it's a flat no, or a, I don't want to, or I'm wanting to change the, the terms and conditions, um, it's difficult to um, go back when the work's already done. So it's, it is important to try and get that done prior to, um, prior to commencement of the work. And I've got one last one here. Mark has asked, will standard public liability cover slips, trips and falls in conducting a survey? Uh, some will, some won't, um, depending on the the wording in the policy. Um, I mean, your public liability covers slips, trips, falls arising from your negligence. So it's if, for what for ninety percent of what marine surveyors do, it's a very skinny risk. You know, for for you to have have um, caused a negligent action that caused a slips, trip, or falls, or third party property damage. It's pretty skinny. Um, some insurers will put a flat um, uh, vessel exclusion on it. So even if you're standing on the vessel um, and somebody you know trips over a laptop bag, or if you use a drone, uh, you know drones are a whole different different kettle of fish. Um, if there's damage times in, in the exclusion, there, there is. Um, uh, a vessel exclusion, um, but for the most part, I mean, we've got we've got a particular product for our marine surveyors that's what's three hundred and eighty dollars total premium for a ten mil limit for your, think, for your public oh, liability, and there's no issue if you're just doing stand. Sorry, Wade, I think I missed um, the question. Was more on a personal nation more than anybody else because you know as as surveyors doing. You know, doing a barge inspection, for instance, climbing in and out of holes, it it is bloody difficult and it is bloody dangerous. Um, are we covered under public liability, or are we covered under the private uh, under your um, uh, other insurance policy? 
Yeah, sorry, professional insurance, uh, indemnity insurance. Oh, he's dropped out. <laughs> no. Ah, you dropped out. I missed you. No, that's all right. Sorry, are you there? Yep. Yep. Uh, sorry, are you meaning uh, damage to the hut? No, damage to the person, damage to the surveyor. Is he covered under the under the pub public liability or is he covered under professional liability or is it a work cover? Well, therefore, you'd have to have work cover insurance, work cover. Um. And or if you were if you were injured because of um, you know if you got out of a, a, the hull and there was a sharper edge on the on the hull or something like that and you were you were injured, you'd be covered under the under the the vessel's public liability, correct? I think I think we might have. Um, there would be a. We're having a few technical issues. Wade, you're, you're dropping in and out. Perhaps um, Mark can email that question to you after we're done. Yeah, okay. I'll email it through. I'd like to know the answer to that too. <laughs> we well, actually question, need though. workers' comp as well as public liability. Well, this is this is mainly this is mainly injury to yourself. There's no insurance, so you your public liability nor your professional indemnity will cover injury to yourself. That's actually, that would be covered under work cover. Then is that correct? So if you have an employee, depending on what state you're in, is dependent on whether the work cover is one required, or secondly, if it will respond in the course of your work. So in some states, working directors are, are required to have workers comp um, if, if you got out of a hull and you cut your leg because the, the hull wasn't maintained well that's that's on the public liability of the vessel owner so if you had to go to you know if you missed two days of work or a week of work or, or whatever the case may be or you know if you lost a leg or, or something it would be on the, the public liability of the vessel owner um, that, that would would respond in in repairing that your, your personal insurance, your public liability and professional indemnity would not respond to those claims. Yes, in some states, the workers' comp would respond to that, which I can provide um, some, uh, you know, some comments on that. So if you, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll send comments to Stacey that she can um, send it around. Because what uh, it On that to question, um, work but, yeah, your, your... So work cover... Um... Is work cover actually well, especially in Victoria? I know is is bloody is is expensive. Yes. Yep. So work cover, we can't get involved in in um, work cover in uh, Victoria. Uh, we can only be involved in in work cover in Western Australia, ACT in Tasmania. The pricing is generally standardised. All the wording is always standardised. But it is um, uh, um, standardised pricing in certain states. Um, but if you, you know, if if it was a work cover claim that responded and and paid for you to be, you know, stitches and days off work and everything like that, the work cover authority will then go and seek recourse against the vessel owner for payment back. So if they've spent fifty grand in, in you know, um, paying for your injury, paying for for rehab your days off, <clears throat> excuse me, impact to the company, they will then go back to the vessel owner and they'll say, uh, Mark was injured because of work that he was doing on your vessel. Uh, here is the bill, please pay us the money back. And they are ruthless in their, their pursuit. Uh, it's, not even, it's not a discussion because they are a government regulated uh, product. They, are, they will get their money. Every day of the week, they are they are quite quite ruthless in, in the way that they seek um, they seek recoveries. So, with that, just go and go and approach QBE or one of the standard work cover. Yeah, yep. and, and ask the question because depending on uh, depending on the profession is depending on the cover. Like for instance, 
in the commercial building industry, yeah, it is quite high. I mean, yes. you know, commercial yes. building definitely is high, high. It's probably one of the higher ones than some of the others. But so, but a lot of the times, as soon as you start put the name surveyor in there, they think you're a building surveyor. So you get blanketed with, um, yeah, back into the construction game. There's not a standard doing. There's not a yeah. It's not the marine sort of surveyor is not a standard um, employee. Yeah employment category so it's a difficult one yeah yeah yep yeah, i agree i agree um different sectors have different loss experiences so the uh, insurers have you know different categories for for that um there's some sectors you know schools schools particularly have really high workers comp um policies uh, uh premiums not because of you know injury but because of stress leave um Builders have, as you say, they're in, in the firing line a bit more. Same with the mining, mining game. But look, yeah, marine professionals, it, it's completely different. You know, you're walking around with a, uh, you know, a tablet and a checklist. Uh, you're not, you're not in the same, um, same exposure. So when you do speak to any of them, whether it be CGU or QBE, make sure you, yeah, spend the time. At, uh, I, I would recommend trying to talk to them. You can explain in a bit more depth exactly what you do so you don't get just roped in. Okay, thanks for that. You still there, Wade? Yes. Yep. yep. Have you got time for one last yes. quick one? Yeah, sorry. Yep, sure. No problem. Uh, Steve's just asked, the AIMS terms and conditions stipulate liability will expire after 12 months. Where do we stand on this? I always have the vessel owner sign a copy prior to commencement of work. Uh, yeah, that, that's fine. Um, but again, look, if, if uh, that ties into the contributory negligence side of things. So you've got the vessel owner to agree to this. Um, if a claim arises three years after, there is still going to be a claim and the policy will still respond. It just mitigates the loss and just helps the insurer defend the matter um, because the vessel owner has agreed to these terms and conditions. They've agreed to the 12 month limit. As such, that the, the amount that the insurer may have to pay may be uh, reduced because you you have done the, done the right thing and, and got them to sign those um, sign that 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 limited liability. So it's a great it's a great thing. Yeah, it's a really good thing to have have that involved. Thank you. And sorry, I know it said it was the last one, but this is definitely the last one. Thomas has just asked: Would an in water survey require additional insurance, especially if you're using ROVs? Um, I tell you, our ROVs are, are like drones. Uh, Thomas, did you want to unmute and you can chat to Wade about that? Remotely operated video. Yes, yeah. So, yes, they would, depending on what exactly, you know, there's rules on certain size of things. Um, your professional indemnity, no, that's, that's fine, that's no problem. But the public liability side of things, yes, you would need a, a slightly broader public liability to make sure that that, that particular um, um, vessel or drone is covered appropriately. Okay, but no, thanks. the professional indemnity side of things, no problem. Okay, well, if that's all the questions we've got. Um, thank you very much, first of all, for Wade, for being here today to give us a presentation and answer our questions. Your input and experience is greatly appreciated. And thank you to all of the members for no taking problem. the time to come today and be involved. This is the first time I've tried a webinar like this. Um, so any feedback if you've got would be appreciated. I will send out just a very quick three question survey if anyone could just fill it out for me, just to gauge a bit of interest in what other sort of uh, webinars like this you may be interested in attending just so that we can start if the members want it 
setting more things up like this, perhaps more informational sometimes, perhaps others. So any input feedback you've got will be greatly appreciated. So thank you very much, everyone. And thank you, Wade. And we'll see you all again soon. Thanks, no worries. Thanks for having me all. Thank you. I, and I will distribute the recording from today as well as Wade's slides in the members area of the website to access as well. Thanks, Wade. Stacey. All right. No worries. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.